Ryan Lindgren makes his triumphant return to the lineup. The Rangers do the impossible and shut down Nathan McKinnon. And Capo Caco has the best shift of his career in the Rangers 3-2 shootout win against the Avs. You're locked on the New York Rangers, your daily podcast on the New York Rangers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Blue Shirts fans, to episode number 1035 of the Locked On New York Rangers podcast. I'm your host, John Chick. Just want to thank you guys, as always, for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. And today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And we are, of course, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So the Rangers coming off of what was obviously a seesaw back and forth game with the Colorado Avalanche, another dramatic come from behind third period win for the Rangers. I mean, really, it was a shootout win, but you know what I mean. They were behind in the third period. We're able to tie it, take the lead. Avs tied it. We go to overtime. We go to a shootout. And the Rangers, once again, finding a way to win. Interesting game because it was kind of a stalemate in the first period. You know, good defensive hockey both ways. And the Rangers obviously boosted by the fact that Ryan Lindgren returned to the lineup. And, you know, he didn't do it alone. But obviously, I I think uh, Ryan Lindgren certainly had a hand in Nathan McKinnon having uh, several incredible, impressive streaks snapped in this game. We're going to talk about that in more detail a little bit later in today's episode. But yeah, Ryan Lindgren, I mean, it didn't look good when he got injured, man. You know, he's down on on, on the ice and um, hit the boards obviously really hard. And the way his leg bent was not good at all. And as he's being helped off the ice, I want to say it was Lafreniere and Gustafson who helped him off. And as that's happening, you know, he's got his arms around both of them and he's not even putting his left leg or his left skate on the ice, much less, you know, putting any weight on that leg. And it didn't look good. And a lot of people are trying to declare that his season is over. I said, let's just hold off here. You know, this is Ryan Lindgren we're talking about. If anybody can, you know, make it back sooner than we might be anticipating, it's certainly Ryan Lindgren. And I think he kind of uh, blew all of our expectations out of the water with how quickly he got back into this lineup. I mean, Once he went down, I think a lot of us probably would have signed up for, okay, if he's back game one of the playoffs, we'll take that. Maybe even like game two or game three into the playoffs because it really didn't look good and you don't want to speculate. But when you see somebody unable to even put weight on their leg, you know, you do your imagination kind of runs wild and you just keep your fingers crossed that, you know, it's not as bad as it looks. And I don't know if Ryan Lindgren is just that tough or he's got a miraculous healing power or whatever the, the issue might be or whatever the deal might be there. But man, I mean, he's back in the lineup again, far sooner than I think probably any of us were expecting when we saw him get injured. He actually beats Jacob Truba back into the lineup. Now, as I said in a recent episode, obviously it's not a race, but you know, Truba gets the somewhat minor injury and we hear that he's going to miss some time, but he'll certainly uh, not be in any danger of missing the playoffs. And with Ryan Lindgren, again, my hope was that he would get back with at least a game or two before the postseason. Nice little bridge, you know, the end of the regular season into the playoffs rather than just having to jump into the deep end that is postseason hockey. But again, he shocks all of us, beats his timetable or, or what at least we perceived would be his timetable. And uh, right back into the lineup, barely a week after that happened. Again, he only missed four games. Uh, just, just really great to see. He ends up being out there for 21 minutes and 11 seconds of ice time. And also, he blocked three shots for the Rangers because, of course, he did. Uh, He did have an instance in this game when the Avalanche tied the game in the third period where he tried to slide the puck under Igor Shesterkin. It was during a scramble in the Ranger crease, and he was not able to do so. It backfired. You know, the puck went into the net. Um, So that was unfortunate, but, you know, a rare... I don't even know if you want to, I mean, I guess it is a mistake, you know, technically, but um, we've seen defensemen do that a lot where, you know, they're, they're, they're in some trouble. There's a scramble in the crease. The goalie's kind of flailing around. You're trying to either get the puck out of there or get a play stoppage. We've seen defensemen tuck the puck under the goalie. This was just an instance where it didn't happen to work. And unfortunately it's a game time goal for the avalanche. 
Um, but again, just just great to see Ryan Lindgren back in the lineup. You know, somebody that he's almost like the Rangers safety net, I would call him. He's, he's one of those guys, I think maybe Lindgren, as much as just about any player on this team, you just don't worry about him. You know, you just pencil him into the lineup. You put him out there with Adam Fox on the top pairing, and you rely on him to do the things he does. Play a physical game, uh, lead the NHL in bloodshed, block shots, um, just play tough as nails hockey. And if he does have an injury, obviously get back out there uh, sooner rather than later, as he just did in this game against the Avalanche last night. But truly a remarkable recovery for Ryan Lindgren. And with Lindgren coming back, that obviously also meant that somebody had to come out. And that was, of course, Brandon Scanlon. But it also kind of got me thinking like, okay, so what happens when everybody's healthy? And again, you can file this under good problems to have because the Rangers right now, I mean, I think they have eight defensemen who... You know, you can nitpick certain things about all of them and you can critique them from this angle or from that angle. But there's eight guys right now that I think have all played pretty good hockey for the Rangers this season. And assuming they don't go with 11 forwards and seven defensemen, only six of those players are going to be in the lineup come playoff time. And seemingly everybody should be healthy. I think uh, five players are basically a lock. Uh, You know, Fox, Lindgren, Miller, Truba, and Schneider. Uh, I can't see a situation where one of them is not out there in game one, provided, of course, that they're all healthy. But then after that, I mean, I, I would think they'd probably stick with Gustafson. You know, he's been there since the start of the season and uh, got off to an awesome start this season. Played poorly during a time when everybody on the Rangers was playing poorly. But overall, I think he's had a pretty nice season for the Rangers. And I think one of the better six defense that they've had in a while. Uh, with that said, though, he's going to have to play well to keep his spot in the lineup because Zach Jones has been very good. Um, you know, he's all over the ice. Uh, you know, it seems like uh, he's stepped up his game defensively, kind of known as an offensive defenseman first, but he's played well. Uh, he's played a simple game and somebody that can add a little bit of offense as well. We saw him out there during the three on three overtime period in this game. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well. But yeah, it's going to be really, really tough to take Zach Jones out of the lineup. I think it's probably something that they ultimately will end up doing if everyone is healthy. And even Ruedel, you know, he comes over from the Penguins in exchange for a fourth round pick. Uh, Seems to be a physical player and made a great play in this game on Wood. Uh, Wood was going up the left side toward the net, you know, trying to get to the net. And Ruedel's doing his best to get back. And I think from a speed perspective, he's a little bit outmatched here. But, you know, he's still busting his tail, trying to get back, trying to get in position. And... He's just barely able to body wood just enough to to prevent him from getting to the net and getting one of those really good scoring chances. And as a result of this, I mean, Ruedel basically went flying, hit the boards, and uh, had to leave the game at that time. So, you know, again, there's eight defensemen that I I think you can feel pretty good about. And it is nice to know, obviously, you don't want anybody to get hurt. But if an injury does happen in the playoffs, I mean, first of all, hopefully it would only be a short-term thing. The player that gets hurt would only miss a game or two at the most, but it's nice knowing you've got, you know, some other options and some guys that you can put out there and feel like, you know, they have a, a pretty good chance of, of doing a solid job all around. So, um, you know, I talked about this in yesterday's episode. We were comparing this team with the 2015 Rangers team that uh, made it to the Eastern Conference final. And we are talking about the defenseman. I think I like this team's defenseman more than that team's defenseman. No offense to any of those players that were on that Ranger team, but the Rangers have depth here and a lot of guys that, bring something to the table. And every defense on this team is just a little bit different. You know, they're not carbon copies of each other. Each one of them has a unique skill set. But obviously, it's really nice to see Ryan Lindgren get back. Uh, He is, as we've said many, many times on this podcast, and certainly we're not the first or last people to say this, but Ryan Lindgren, uh, truly the heart and soul of the New York Rangers. And uh, just awesome to see him back. Glad he got through the game healthy. And uh, hopefully, he's good to go come playoff time. We'll keep everything rolling in just a second here. I want to shift our attention to Nathan McKinnon and the Rangers somehow, some way being able to keep him from scoring any points uh, during a home game, which had not happened all season. More on that in just a second. First, though, we definitely would like to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked on New York Rangers is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with eBay Motors, you are burning rubber and not cash. With all the parts you need at all the prices you want, 
It is easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today. A free 24-7 streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news. Streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. So let's go ahead and keep everything rolling then and uh, talk a little bit about the Rangers uh, becoming streak busters in this game last night because Nathan McKinnon is having uh, quite the season here. 19 game point streak coming into last night's game. He has a total of 38 points. So exactly two points per night for McKinnon over a 19 game stretch. Uh, this is also his second or was his second 19 game point streak of the season. First player in NHL history to do that twice in the same season. Um, and, you know, the Rangers played well. They, they, it seemed like they always were aware of where he was on the ice. Uh, you had Adam Fox doing a nice job against McKinnon uh, in the corner. Uh, Barkley Goodrow, man, nice place, nice play on him as well. Uh, basically, McKinnon was trying to get to the net, and Goodrow cut him off, you know, kind of set him behind the net, and was kind of, uh, you know, Goodrow kind of had the inside track and was preventing McKinnon from, you know, coming back out in front of the net on the other side. McKinnon went around to the corner. Uh, Trocek was there. Goodrow got a little bit of help from Trocek, but it felt like anywhere – uh, McKinnon went, the Rangers had two players on him. You know, it almost felt like it's not really a hockey thing, like, like double teaming somebody, but it, it's kind of, uh, it kind of felt like that's what was going on in this game. The Rangers were going to do everything possible uh, to not allow Nathan McKinnon to beat them. And that's not to say there aren't any other good players on the avalanche, but if you have a chance against them, you got to at least keep him in check. Very, very difficult to keep him off the score sheet entirely as we are well aware, but um, you got to at least limit him and not allow him to take over the game the way that he's done so many times this season. And again, he had a point in every home game, all 35 home games for the Avalanche uh, this season before this game last night. It's funny, though, when they said that on the broadcast, I just had this weird feeling that like tonight's the night. Rangers are going to shut this guy down. He's not going to get any points. And I, I think maybe part of the reason I felt that way is because in the last game against the Flyers, I mean, that game was out of control, really, really just the third period. Um, the first two periods, uh, Flyers, I think, were up 2-1 going into the third, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that that's right. And so, you know, going into the third, you think it's going to be more of the same. It ends up being this just crazy high-speed third period with just uh, odd man rushes up and down the ice and all kinds of scoring opportunities and power play chances and what have you. And the Rangers obviously played some leaky defense in that game against the Flyers. Now, of course, uh, they found a way to still get the win in overtime, and good on them for doing that. But I don't know. It just felt like coming into this game that the Rangers were going to have, after a performance like that, kind of a renewed focus on team defense, on structure. And I think we saw that. And nowhere is that more apparent than this very simple fact that Nathan McKinnon did not get on the score sheet. He almost did. You know, that goal that the Avalanche scored to tie the game in the second period, um, that ended up being unassisted. And my understanding is the Avalanche have actually asked the NHL to review that because you can actually review uh, scoring decisions as far as this guy got a goal and that guy had an assist. Um, I'm sure they'd like to see his streak alive. But as of right before me pushing the record button here, uh, that had still not happened. That's still listed as an unassisted goal for Taze. And whether that ends up getting changed to an assist or not, bottom line, Rangers still did a really nice job against Nathan McKinnon. But let's leave that unassisted. I think that's a nice little notch on the belt for the Rangers just to uh, say that they were the team to finally, you know, um, shut down Nathan McKinnon for at least one night. Um, but one other thing that I, I can mention about, you know, this entire situation here, to me, this is another very, very good reminder that the Rangers, and I've been saying this a couple of times in recent episodes, they can win games in a lot of different ways. I just mentioned the Flyer game. It was completely out of control. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the third period was just um, something to, to behold. You know, um, the game had been kind of a stalemate up to that point, and then everything opens up, and uh, obviously just a, a battle all the way into overtime and everything. But when you look at, you know, the way the Rangers have won games lately and the all the different teams that they've beaten, uh, they are doing it in a variety of different ways. And on top of that, this is another very good team that the Rangers beat. I, I keep hearing, you know, that this, it's not a myth. I, I should have, uh, I actually did talk about this in our myth busting episode, but there's this idea that the Rangers can't beat good teams or don't beat good teams or don't play their best against good teams. I mean, 
they've lost some games to some good teams, but they've also won a lot of games against some very good teams, some bona fide Stanley Cup contenders. And I think Colorado uh, certainly is one of those teams. And Rangers obviously found a way to get the job done here. Uh, once again, coming from behind in the third period to do so, and then outlasting them all the way through overtime and uh, ultimately the shootout as well. We're going to keep everything rolling in just a second. I want to uh, turn our attention to uh, breaking down what I thought was possibly the best NHL shift of Capo Caco's career. He literally did just about everything on this play. It wasn't even a long shift. You know, the defensive zone draw happened for the Rangers and they won it and couldn't have been much longer than like 10 or 15 seconds later that the puck was in the net for the Rangers. But Caco was so, so good here. So we're going to talk about that, give him his props, and uh, just kind of break down some of the other big moments in this game. We're going to name our unsung hero of the game as well. And uh, also give a shout out to some of the uh, members of the Locked On New York Rangers Fantasy League. We're in our playoffs now, so want to give uh, the, the teams that made um, the the playoffs their, their flowers here at the end of today's episode. So we'll, we will do all that fun stuff in just a second. All right, let's go ahead and uh, keep everything rolling here. Uh, as I mentioned, I really do think that Capo Caco, possibly the best shift of his NHL career. This happened, of course, with the Rangers down one nothing in the third period. And by the way, you know, I mentioned the Rangers coming from behind a win. Obviously, the first two periods, you know, the, the first period was a complete stalemate. Very few scoring chances either way. Second period opened up a little bit. Some good saves from both Igor and our old friend Alex Georgiev. And then, of course, the Avalanche score, you know, a goal that's tough to give up there, you know, because you're in a scoreless tie, you give one up with about 30 seconds to go in the second period, and then you still come out in the third period playing very well. Rangers scored two goals in the first 10 minutes of the third period, and they go on uh, to win the game in dramatic fashion. So let's just give the Rangers props for that first and foremost. But as for Kako here, uh, once again, the Rangers, this is this was right after um, the play where uh, Ruedel made that strong defensive play to prevent Wood from getting to the net. And obviously, Ruedel hit the boards hard. This is the faceoff right after that. So Ruedel's play also kind of led to this. We'll give Ruedel an unassisted or uh, an unofficial assist on this as well. But yeah, best shift of Kako's career. So the Rangers win the defensive zone draw. We get a rush into the Colorado zone thanks to a really, really nice pass from Kako. You know, again, the Rangers get control in their own zone and Kako receives a pass in the neutral zone. He's along the boards on the right side and a little bit shy of the red line. So he's still on the Rangers side of the ice in the neutral zone. And just a great pass here. And this aspect of the play, I think, kind of got overlooked a little bit. And it's understandable why, because so much happened after this. And of course, Kako ends up scoring a goal. But Puck is along the boards. He's got a Colorado player, you know, approaching him, probably looking to deliver a hit. So he's under pressure, doesn't have a lot of time with the puck, makes a brilliant backhand pass right on the tape to lead Ryan Lindgren into the attacking zone. It's not one of those things that's like you'll you'll see it over and over on top 10 plays of the night or anything like that, but this is a really good pass. I mean, you know, again, backhand and under pressure, not a lot of room to maneuver, and perfectly leads Ryan Lindgren over the blue line uh, into the Colorado zone. So that's first and foremost. Kako's already kind of got his fingerprints on this play. And then Lindgren, you know, he's going in a little bit up the right side, tries to pass left to Johnny Brodzinski. His pass is blocked. Avalanche briefly get control of it. And there's Kako, you know, swarming into the offensive zone, stealing the puck away, makes a really nice move uh, to get away from a Colorado defender and gets behind the net. And from there, he tries to pass in front to Brodzinski. Uh, Brodzinski got knocked down to the ice. I don't know if Brodzinski technically uh, got credited with a shot on goal here, but Kako was trying to set up Brodzinski. Uh, like I said, the puck briefly got to Brodzinski, but not to the ice. Puck goes back to Kako, and this time, Kako decides to bank his shot off of Alex Georgiev and into the night. So an unassisted goal for Capo Kako. I mean, what a shift. You've got the great backhand pass. You've got the steal on the four check with him hustling in there to get to it. You've got a really nifty move to get around a defender, get to the back of the net. You've got a brilliant pass in front of the net. I mean, not brilliant, but it was a good pass in front of the in front of the net to Johnny Brodzinski. That didn't work. It comes back to him. And then having the wherewithal and the smarts to, okay, there's nobody to pass to right now. My guy's down on the ice. I'm going to bank it off Georgiev and in, and that's exactly what he does. Like I said, I think that, it, for my money, the best NHL shift of Capo Caco's career. And he's really played a lot better recently. He was beyond jinxed at the start of the season between, you know, just not being able to get anything going offensively and uh, the injury, of course. And it feels like, you know, he's really kind of hitting his stride lately. And 
Um, it's a good time of the year to be playing some of your best hockey because we are down to single digit games remaining for the Rangers before the start of the Stanley Cup playoffs. So a um, couple other things I wanted to uh, mention here before we call it a day. There was some controversy on the Rangers go ahead goal. It was set up when Artemi Panarin drew a penalty on a, a strong effort to, to get to the net, kind of weaved his way between a couple of guys and ended up being held. Uh, you've got the Ranger power play. Trotrek wins the face off clean because of course he does. Uh, great puck possession here by the Rangers. They never gave up the puck. They also, um, you know, had some good puck movement through this whole thing. And Panarin shoots from the blue line. And the puck ends up landing at Kreider's skates, and he buries it. Uh, career goal number 299 for Chris Kreider, so one away from a very impressive milestone. Rangers up 2-1. The controversy came in because there was some talk about maybe it was technically a hand pass by Vincent Trocek because when Panarin shot it, it did hit Trocek kind of up high and then went to Kreider. So the avalanche... Uh, challenged it, but the call on the ice stood. And this is directly from the NHL as far as explaining this call. The situation room confirmed that the puck deflected off the cuff of Vincent Trocek's glove prior to Chris Kreider's goal. Therefore, it was deemed not to be a hand pass. So there you go. We'll take it. I mean, that's we're, we're talking like, you know, uh, how much would that even be? Like a couple of millimeters off, you know? So um, good that that goal obviously stood. And the Rangers end up getting a power play. They did not score on it. But, of course, the Avalanche lose their challenge. That puts the Rangers on the man advantage. We end up uh, getting the Avalanche game-tying goal they are, that we already discussed. It tied it at 2-2. We go to overtime. And the Rangers start with Trocek, Panarin, and Miller. Uh, Fox, at this point, was in the locker room. I think he's okay. I haven't seen anything, like, definitive today. And the fact that nobody's really talking about it makes me think that uh, Adam Fox must not be in uh, dire straits or anything along those lines. But it was just interesting to see uh, them go with that trio. I think Miller's probably the right pick there if uh, if Adam Fox is not available. But then you had Zach Jones was the next player on the ice for the Rangers. And I, I talked about him earlier and how well he's played. And I think the simple fact that the fourth skater to touch the ice in overtime for the New York Rangers was Zach Jones. That's impressive. And I think it tells you what the coaching staff thinks of the way that he's played recently. Now, of course, I mean, that's obviously influenced by the fact that Miller was the first player to leave the ice. So obviously there's going to be a defenseman that jumps on in his place. It's also influenced by the fact that Adam Fox is not available, but be that as it may, the Rangers still going to Zach Jones uh, early in the overtime period. We had Igor Shesterkin making some really nice saves in overtime. I mean, he was making really good saves all night. Uh, makes a save on Lekkonen on the rush up the left side. Uh, right after this, or not too long after this, we had Igor making a point blank save on Taze. With about 45 seconds to go in the game. And looking at the box score on NHL.com, it says that Eeyore stopped 39 of 40 shots. And for a second, I was really confused there because the Avalanche scored two goals, right? But I believe that because uh, the second goal that the Avalanche scored, I believe that since it was knocked in by Lindgren, that the idea there is that doesn't count as a shot on goal because the Rangers did it to themselves. I, I would imagine that's probably the ruling there. It's not something that comes up all that often, but um, but yeah, that's that's where things stand. And uh, hey, just an even more impressive uh, stat line for Igor Shesterkin. And that's another thing. You know, I, I mentioned in a recent episode how, oh man, like it's cool that we don't even have to like worry about Lafreniere anymore because we did an episode where Lafreniere, after the Flyers game, had two goals. And I mentioned at the very end, like, you know what? That's just kind of what he does now. Like he's a very important uh, player that contributes a lot to this team. We don't have to make a big deal out of Lafreniere having a multi-point night the way that we might have needed to earlier this season and in, in past seasons as well. And it's kind of the same thing with Igor Shesterkin here. You know, he obviously went through his trials and tribulations this season. And I mean, we were watching everything he did under a magnifying glass. And he has a game like this, you know, beats the avalanche on the road, stops 39 of 40 shots, wins it in the shootout, doesn't allow a goal in the shootout. And it's kind of just like, yep, you know, Igor being Igor. And, and that's a very good place uh, for him to be, and I think for all of us collectively as fans to be, uh, once again, as we head to the playoffs. There's a lot of things that are starting to click and starting to really go right for this Ranger team as the postseason approaches. And like I said, uh, you have to feel good about that if you're a Ranger fan. But we end up going into overtime. You know, Trojak had a shot at the buzzer here, and Alex Georgiev had to make a nice glove save. I, I get the feeling it probably would have counted. But yeah, we go to the shootout, and we get Panarin scoring. You know, he goes wide left, moves in, makes a bunch of, you know, quick moves, you know, stick handles shoots off the top of the glove and in. And then you've got middle stat uh, making some dekes on Igor Shesterkin, but Igor stayed with him all the way, uh, never really bit on any of the moves that he was making and uh, found a way to make the stop. We've got Mika going in. He goes wide right, 
a couple of moves on the doorstep. He tried to use that move that he used in the last game where he basically kind of goes one way, the puck goes the other way, and he one-hands the puck into the net. And this time it didn't work. It just kind of slipped off of his stick. And um, obviously he did not score. Then you get Rontanen uh, for the Avalanche. He just goes right up the middle, tries to shoot it quickly, and Igor makes what seemed to be a pr pretty simple save uh, for him. And then uh, Trocek with the walk-off goal here. He goes wide left, cuts in, makes a couple of nifty moves on the doorstep, scores over the glove. And this is why you have to shoot first in the shootout when you're at home and you have the option of going first or last. Because if you're the Avalanche here, you never even got your third skater a chance to shoot in the shootout. The Rangers got to shoot three times, the Avalanche only twice. And um, I just don't think that's a situation you want to be in. Uh, you know, I would imagine it probably would have been McKinnon, right? I mean, why not? And he never even gets to shoot in the shootout. So there you go. Dramatic win for the Rangers. Not everything they did was perfect, but it was nice to see them once again figure out a way to get it done. Once again, post another come-from-behind win and, you know, tighten things up defensively. I think that's probably the most encouraging uh, storyline to come out of this game for the Rangers. As far as your unsung hero for this game, we're going Ryan Lindgren. Again, I talked about him earlier. We can keep it brief here, but just the fact that he's back on the ice as quickly as he was, he's still out there, you know, blocking shots and uh, just being the Ryan Lindgren that we all know and love, uh, that's very, very encouraging to see. And uh, obviously, you know, we hope he stays healthy because they're going to need him come playoff time. The, the stats that the Rangers have put up in terms of goals allowed over the last handful of seasons when he's in the lineup versus when he's not in the lineup are noticeably different. I mean, it's literally like I think more than a half goal more per game when he's not in the lineup. So that's obviously a big difference. And look, I mean – that's not all because of Ryan Lindgren. You know, sometimes in some ways stats just kind of happen. But when you've got a defenseman where there's that much of a difference in terms of goals allowed when he's out there versus when he's not out there, that is obviously an eye-opening stat. And it's certainly a stat that matters. Um, so figure we can call it there. Uh, th that was a season sweep, by the way, of the Rangers over the Avalanche. We had Lafreniere being the Avalanche in overtime earlier this season. So the Rangers sweep another very good team, another cup contending team. And one more thing I want to do before we call it here is a uh, shout out, like I said, the eight playoff teams from our Locked On New York Ranger Fantasy League. And I'm just going to run through it really quick here. We've got the quarterfinals currently underway. We've got number eight seed Travis, the coach of the Pennsylvania Punishers, taking on myself, the number one seeded Cobra Kai. I currently have a 6-2-2 two and two, uh, record against Travis. Basically, there's 12 stats. And when you win a stat, you get a win. When you lose a stat, you get a loss. When you tie a stat, you get a tie. And obviously, this is the playoffs. So whoever gets uh, the most wins will move on. Um, but yeah, I've got a lead right now. But I got to say, I'm not comfortable. You know, this thing can swing any which way. You never know what can happen. And uh, on Saturday, I, I think basically every team in the NHL is playing. And both myself and Travis do have a full lineup on that day. So we'll see what happens. We've also got the, let's see, the number four seeded or the number five seeded easy peasy leading the number four seeded Laviolette's win the cup. Uh, he's seven, two and one is easy peasy who is coached by Steven and Laviolette's win the cope when the cup is coached by Michael and uh, we'll see what happens there. I will uh, also check out the other matchups here. We've got, the number six seeded Aussie Troubadours up against the number three seeded Kings Ring. Uh, the Aussie Troubadours, coached by Ryan, have a 6 3 and 1 uh, lead uh, over Corey, who coaches the Kings Ring. And then finally, our last quarterfinal matchup here is the number seven seeded No Cap up against the number two seeded Stratford Nighthawks. Uh, Stratford Nighthawks, coached by Dan, have a 5 4 and 1 lead over the Number seven seated, uh, no cap coached by Xavier. So again, just wanted to give everybody a shout out. It's always a lot of fun, you know, playing fantasy hockey with you guys and uh, having, you know, some fun smack talk and whatnot. And anybody who played last year, you're welcome to come back next year. If you didn't play last year and you'd like to play next year, uh, send me an email. We can save your place in line and, you know, I'll, uh, I'll send out invites about that going into next season. But figure we can call it there for today, guys. Once again, if you'd like to get in touch with this podcast, please send an email to locked on. NYRangers at gmail.com. Once again, that is locked on NYRangers at gmail.com. Definitely give us a follow on Twitter as well at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. Once again, that is at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. And definitely subscribe to Locked On New York Rangers YouTube channel. Thanks again, guys. I will see you next time.